Hey guys, welcome back to the Read Like a Man podcast. In today's episode, we are talking about The Warrior Poet Way by John Lovell. This book came out exactly a week ago at this point, and uh, I pre-ordered it, picked it up the day that it came out, and oh, it's really good. It's really, really good. I'm really excited to talk to you guys about this book. So we're going to jump right into it. Uh, we're going to start off talking about what makes this book special, right? The first point that I want to hit here is that John is a true example of a warrior poet who is actually walking the walk. A lot of times what I've found with books, especially by Christian guys, is they, in the modern times, they tend to kind of be too heavy on the, this guy lives only the 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 spiritual side or you know in the warrior poet sense like this guy really lives on the on the poet end of things and he's not someone that i super look up to on the warrior side of things there's there's much more a it's much more normal to have guys lacking on the warrior side than it is to have them lacking on the poet side nowadays. John is not that at all. This is a guy who's served as an army ranger. He had five different deployments to, between Afghanistan and Iraq, and he runs a training company currently teaching people concealed carry stuff, teaching them how to shoot, teaching them how to fight. He's got all of this gear line that he does and makes for people, and he's just he's someone who's very much walking the walk. And in really trying to live out everything that he talks about with being a warrior poet. And so that's really, really cool to me. That's something that I really look for in modern manhood books that are specifically from Christian men, because that's lacking in, in quite a few of them, unfortunately. <laughs> So um, the next point that I want to hit is that in a culture terrified of speaking up, John writes boldly about his Christian faith, the insanity of woke culture, the dangers of modern tyranny, and the critical, critical importance of marriage and family, right? And I love this. Like, I, I love reading something from a guy that comes right out and is like, dude, no matter how successful you are, if it took you three marriages to get there... Like, you did not succeed as a man. And if you became a gajillionaire, but your kids don't have any relationship with you, you did not succeed as a man. And I just love that. I love the fact that he is not afraid to just say what the truth is and really to, to come against some of the outright lies that we deal with and then a lot of the much more insidious just like, mm, they're just there in the back of all of our minds. We don't really want to think about it. I don't really want to talk about it. And he's just like, boom, here you go. We're, we're saying it. I'm just saying it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love the way that he just hits stuff on the head and is not backing down on any of these topics. It's great. My favorite quote of the book was when he said, when a man fears discomfort, danger is never far off. And we'll go into that more because it, it really ties into my whole entire takeaway of this book. But yeah, it just, if, if you have gotten to the place where you fear being uncomfortable, mm, like stuff's about to go real, real bad in your life. And that is something that I have noticed myself struggling with at different points in life. And so that's something that hit me very, very hard and just kind of made me like, Oh, dang. Yeah, bro. Need to, need to, need to work on that. So yeah, there we go. When a man fears discomfort, danger is never far off. Favorite quote of the book. So overall, what's, what's he talking about here? We, we want to be, we want to become warrior poets. The complete man is a warrior and a poet. And I love what he talks about where it's not a 50, 50 thing. We're not 50% warrior, 50% poet. We're a hundred percent warrior and we're a hundred percent poet. And anything less than that is incomplete. It's not this balance of like, oh, I'm part this, I'm part that. It's when I need to be a warrior, I'm 100% the warrior. When I need to be the poet, I'm 100% the poet. And I can balance back and forth between being those things because it's that's that's how I was designed and who I was created to be. And I love how he says this, the warrior poet is someone who has the mind of a student, the heart of a romantic, and the skills of a fighter. That definition to me was just like, Perfect. Yep. That's exactly who I want to be. I love this. <laughs> um, yeah. Anything less than that is not a man fully alive. It's just, it's not. And, and we have such a thing again in the modern culture, it's more of a deal of 
we're we're lacking on the warrior side than we are lacking on the poet side, especially in, in Christian circles. Um, but it doesn't really matter. Whichever one you're lacking in, it's still not living fully in the calling of who God made you to be as a man. And so whichever one it is that you're lacking in, this book will encourage you to get a move on <laughs> and, and start training up yourself in the ways of the warrior or the ways of the poet. So if we start with that, the warrior is, his definition of a warrior is someone who is good at winning a fight, but bad at being killed. <laughs> I love that. Like that definition to me was just like, all right, all right, I can, I can do that. And the, the whole thing about being, becoming the warrior is that it starts with embracing discomfort. If you see discomfort, if you come across a situation where you're going to be uncomfortable and you run from it, that is the guarantee that you never grow into a warrior. The way that you start becoming a warrior is when you are faced with discomfort, you embrace it and you walk into it and you start to move through it and you learn how to walk through being uncomfortable and doing things that you don't like and doing things that hurt, right? So the goal is to become the most dangerous man in the room. That's the whole goal of the warrior. And it's not, the, the problem that we have in modern culture is that we think this is a lot about how you look. I want to look like the most dangerous man in the room. And he has a whole part in the book where he talks about, it's not about how you look. You actually don't want to look like the most dangerous man in the room because that makes you become a target. That makes you be someone that if the bad guy does show up, he's like, hey, I'm going to take him out first because yeah, you want to be the guy that the bad guy comes in the room, scans and is like, oh, that guy's no threat. He's no, he's, yeah, I don't have to worry about him and moves right on. So the goal is to become what he calls the gray man. And this is the one that nobody suspects of being able to kill them in two seconds flat, <laughs> but who actually can, right? Everything about becoming the warrior is becoming the most dangerous man in the room, but not actually looking like the most dangerous man in the room. And he says, a dangerous person not only has the mind that can destroy you, but the skills to bring you to a swift end at any time. So again, it's still this balance thing, where it's not even just the skills that we want to learn of how to actually fight or how to actually shoot or how to actually defend yourself. It's also developing this mindset of a warrior and this mindset of how do I avoid the fight in the first place? And if I am going to get in the fight, how do I take a mental advantage over my opponent so that it doesn't even become a fair fight because I never want to be in a fair fight with a bad guy. I want to be in a completely unfair fight <laughs> that's totally biased in my way. And so it's learning how to use the mind. The story that he tells is he asks his two boys, um, is it better to be smart or strong? And his one son said strong because then you can just beat, beat the bad guy up. And then his other son says it's better to be smart because then you can sneak around the bad guy, then jump on him and then beat him up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes, dude. So that's that idea of the warrior and, and becoming the most dangerous man in the room is you want to be smart and strong within that. And then when you're, when you're working in this journey of becoming the warrior, the first thing that you have to do is face the inner coward, right? And this is a thing that every man has and every man has to face in order to become the warrior. And so the, the piece that he talks about is that courage begins with the humility to confess the truth. And before you can defeat the inner coward that we all have, you have to acknowledge that he's actually there and that he exists, right? And so the the way that the way that we begin this journey is first off with the confession that the inner coward is here and there's there's a man inside us that is terrified and that doesn't want to do hard things and doesn't want to be in dangerous situations and doesn't want to shoulder responsibility and all that. And then we confess that, we acknowledge it, and then we choose to move past it. And the way we move past it is the primary way that we learn to begin to move past it is pushing past physical pain. And we do that to show the inner coward that he's not in control. And one of the things that John talked about that I loved is in teaching his boys how to start to do this, um, he, he looks at the idea of like letting boys cry or not. And I loved what he said was, he, he says that it's okay to cry for emotional pain. And like, if your heart is hurting, it's okay to cry and to let those feelings out. But if you have physical pain or something, that's when we just suck it up and we just deal with it, right? And I, I think, I'm still not 100%, but I think I like very much agree with that sentiment and really like that idea because it's just this thing of like, oh, if it's, if it's a heart thing and it's a, 
emotional thing that we're going through, we have to deal with that through crying and letting those emotions out. We have to we have to process those emotions, right? I'm super big on all that with the emotion code and body code stuff, like all this. Like we have to be able to deal and process with those emotions. But when it becomes to a physical thing, the I tell my kids all the time, like the crying and getting all like, ah, doesn't actually help. It makes the pain worse. And so if we can start to teach our kids and ourselves that when there's physical pain, we don't cry about that. We just suck it up. And if there's heart or emotional pain, then it's okay to cry. I think that's a really, really good way to start to train that resistance to the inner coward that doesn't want to deal with the hard things and doesn't want to have to make any hard decisions and whatever. I think that's a great way to start to train that. I love the story that he told on one of these was his boys, one of his boys was out running around and he had like fallen and scraped his knee and he was, it was bleeding and he was crying so hard, you know, he couldn't stop. He couldn't get him to calm down and whatever. And, uh, and so John goes, finally, I just took out my pocket knife and I cut my forearm and it was bleeding. And I like showed it to him. I was like, see, like this hurts. I'm bleeding just like you are now, but I'm not crying and I'm not freaking out and I'm choosing to be okay and to toughen up and handle the pain. And he was like, and you just saw the sea change come across the face of my boy of like, oh my gosh, like you can... Like dad like hurt himself intentionally. Like I know how bad that hurts because I got cut on my knee and it's bleeding and now dad's cut and he's bleeding, but he did it to himself and he hasn't even cried. And he's, you know, it was just this idea of like, like modeling this toughness in such a, um, like direct and obvious way. And he was like, it fundamentally changed how my boys started to view how do we toughen up and just handle the, the physical pain of stuff. So I loved. I love that story. And it was just like, oh my gosh, wow, that is, wow, okay. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, so just really, really, really cool, cool stuff there talking about how do we face the inner coward. And then, then the second part of the book, we're, we're looking at how do we, how do we grow the poet, right? And the poet is really this idea that you must, the foundation of it is you must become a philosopher. You have to be a lover of wisdom. That is the foundation of the poet side. And John talks about how the biggest war that we're currently facing is right now at this particular moment in time is not a, not the danger of, of physical war so much. If you live in the U S you know, kind of where we're at right now, like it's, it's not so much the danger of physical war and fighting as it is the danger of an, of the war of ideas. And so in this war of ideas and ideology, our mind is our greatest weapon. And so we have to train our children and train ourselves to increase our mental capacity and acuity in order to engage with this war of ideas. Cause that's really where the, the war is being fought and the future of humanity and especially our nation is being fought right now. And so the number one way that we do that, which obviously I'm all down for, is create and cultivate a lifestyle of reading in order to stave off ignorance and deceit. And I love that phrasing. That was exactly the phrasing that he used is we do this, we create a lifestyle of reading in order to stave off ignorance and deceit. And um, he quoted John Steinbeck at this point in here, which I just loved. He's, John had said, the final weapon is the brain and everything else is supplemental. And yeah, just, I, I really loved, I really loved that quote. So then we went on and we, t- we talked about the muse. And this is this idea that the wars that we wage as warrior poets are a means to an end. And that end is relationships right? And so you have to be fighting and living for something more than just, oh, my life. Like no guy was made to, to live in just the purposelessness of just my life and living for me. We're all made for something more than that. Obviously the most apparent relationship would be the relationship with your bride. And John talks a lot about this of how your bride is there to inspire you to become and then force you to improve as a poet because your bride 0.5% of the time, you know, needs the warrior of you who's out here slaying zombies that are, you know, trying to attack her. And the whole rest of the time, she needs the poet. She needs the philosopher. She needs the soft, kind and gentle, but still strong, loving side of the man. And so that, that relationship becomes one of the primary ones that gives us a 
reason and a purpose for the fighting that we do. But the ultimate relationship is your walk with Jesus Christ. And I love how blatantly open John is about being a Christian, about having a relationship with Jesus, about that being the thing that informs and guides and just directs everything else in all of his life and, and gives him this definition of manhood that he's trying to chase after. Really, you know, he, he got this from looking at the life of Jesus, right? And so just this idea that all, I love that saying that all the wars that we wage are the means to an end and the end is always relationship. And so foundationally, if you're a Christian, that relationship is with Christ first and then with your wife and then with your kids and then with any friends and family and everything other than that. But I love keeping that in mind. It just, I don't know why, I still haven't even really figured out why that hit me as hard as it did. But just this idea of we wage wars as a means to an end and the end is relationship every time. That's why, that's why we're fighting. And then uh, my favorite quote from this one was, was where he said, purposelessness is death to the masculine soul. And that I was just like, oh, dude, oh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and when you look around it at modern manhood in society you just see that you see this these guys all all walking around they're waging wars but the wars that they're waging are are not a means to the end of relationship they're a means to the end of selfishness and selfishness cannot give purpose it's like selfishness is just tied directly into purposelessness and so purposelessness when all these guys are waging the war that go to purposelessness it just ends in the death of the masculine soul and to me that's so obvious when you look across culture nowadays that this is just an epidemic that's happening everywhere with all of the men in our culture and so the last point that I wanted to touch on here was his chapter about little warrior poets and about raising kids. This was one of my favorite chapters in this whole entire book. And I love how direct he is <laughs> that it's your job to raise your kids. Don't outsource it. Don't give it up to the government. Don't give it up to a daycare person. Don't give it up to somebody else. And this is like, this is a, this is a touchy, touchy subject. And it's not, it's not something that I know I or John would ever want somebody to feel bad in a comparison way about, right? If they, you know, if they look at, cause he and I are very similar in this sense of like, we, you know, both of our wives homeschool, we work from home fairly, you know, consistently, like we're a big part of our kids' lives. And there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff and a whole bunch of reasons um, why people don't do stuff like that. And it's not a, this is the only way to do it thing, but it is, and I think he balances this really well. It is a thing where if your heart attitude is outsourcing it, that's a problem regardless of the actions that you're taking. So it's not necessarily this thing that like, oh, you have to homeschool in order to be a good parent. It's just a thing of in general, if you're homeschooling, it's because your heart attitude has to be that you want to be more involved in the raising of your children. Um, but I know a lot of people who, even though they don't homeschool and their kids are in the public school system and they both work or whatever, whatever, you can do those things, but still have a heart attitude and a heart view that is correct, that it is primarily my responsibility and I'm not giving my kids out for someone else to raise them. I am very intentionally coming alongside and asking what they learned in school and asking what they learned in class and asking what they did about this and, and being very, very intentional and understanding my role that the primary, primary responsibility for raising these kids is mine. And I love how just direct John is on this because this is a big issue for me. This is why we homeschool our kids. It's part of the reason why I work from home and am very, very involved in trying to shape our kids and raise our kids with the values that we have because I know that ultimately I'm held responsible for how they were raised. And so that's not something I'm ever comfortable outsourcing to anyone else because God didn't give those kids to anyone else. He gave those kids to me. So I love, 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 love how important he makes that topic and stresses it. And ultimately, the biggest thing about that is that when you start to take responsibility for raising your own kids, you realize that you cannot give what you don't have. And so you have to get this right in yourself first. 
and then you can move on and give it to your kids. And I love the balance that he talks about between mothers and fathers. And he says, kids need mothers and fathers, and neither can take the place of the others. And the quote that he had was, we need mothers to keep our boys alive, and we need fathers to make them hard to kill. And dad, I'm like, I, don't, I, don't even, I don't even have anything to add to that. Like, that's just, that's just pretty much perfect how it is. <laughs> Uh, but the the overall my favorite quote from this this whole section of it was he said we must let our children become poets before requiring them to become warriors we must teach them innocence then wisdom and then war and that gave me a lot of peace and it lifted a lot of burden off of me because my oldest son right now is nine and I'm kind of getting to the point where I'm like, oh man, you know, like I'm not seeing enough of the, of the warrior spirit. And I don't know if I've done a good job training him to be tough enough and, you know, and all this stuff and kind of putting a lot of pressure on myself to like, oh, he needs to be the warrior now and kind of sidestepping and, and putting these steps in the wrong order. And so reading this just brought a lot of peace to my soul of understanding, no, he doesn't become a warrior at, at nine. First, we teach them innocence, and then we teach them wisdom, and then we teach them war. They have to become poets first, and then later on they become warriors. And when I look at it in that view, I'm like, oh, okay, sweet. Like, I'm right on track. Like, we're right on track with our kids. They're they're learning in a sense. They're learning to be poets, and especially my oldest son right now. You know, it's like I'm, you know, like he's he's interested in learning and growing in the ability to be a poet. And then later on, we can start to train more of the warrior in him. And and I don't have to be so concerned about like it has to be this perfect thing now, right? And as much as it's like, oh, time with kids goes so fast, you know, and already that you know he's nine. It's like it goes so fast, but it also is a long time. You know, it's only, you know, it's halfway, right? So now is not the time that he has to be perfect. He doesn't have to be a perfect little warrior poet right now at nine. He needs to be a foundationally secure warrior poet at 18 when he's going off into the world by himself, right? So I still have time and I still have um, opportunity to get this correct in my own heart well and then pass it on to him well from there. So yeah, I, I just absolutely loved this chapter from the book and uh, asked my wife to read it because I was like, I think this would be very, very good for us to have a conversation about. So if you guys get it, I would recommend having your wives read both the last two chapters, the one on um, the one on the warrior poets, and then the kind of like a bigger mindset chapter was kind of his, his last wrap up thing. So anyways, my takeaways from this whole book, the one of the biggest ideas was the whole, it's not 50, 50 thing. It's a hundred, 100. You're a hundred percent warrior. You're a hundred percent poet. And I think where I have struggled in life is trying to balance this like, oh, it's 60, 40, or it's 50, 50, or it's 70, 30, or whatever, whatever. And being able to view it in this idea of, no, it's a hundred percent. I'm a hundred percent warrior and I'm a hundred percent poet. Again, like free so much, lifts lift so much weight off of me to to be able to not be be weighed down by this sense of shame and guilt, and be able to approach this in a fresh way and be like, oh yes, I am a hundred percent poet, and I've been doing a good job embracing that and growing in that, and I am also a hundred percent warrior, but I haven't done a great job recently embracing that and growing in that, and so these are the ways that I want to move forward, growing in that side of myself. Um, the next biggest thing was just that everything, everything, everything starts with how you deal with discomfort. If you run from discomfort, you're screwed. You never become anything that you were supposed to be. So the number one thing is constantly finding ways in your life to create and embrace discomfort. And the crazy thing with our modern culture is that you really half the time it's so difficult because you have to find a way to create the discomfort first before you can embrace it because there's just not that much discomfort going around. And so that was just a, a very fundamental building block for me of like, okay, create it and embrace it, create it and embrace it every day, find some way that I can create discomfort and embrace it and then move on from there. Uh, the next point that I had was that the only way to forge your boys into men is to forge yourself into a man first. This has been huge for me even before reading this book, this idea that you can't give what you don't have. And so they can only go as far and only become as good of men as I have become. 
And so I have to focus on getting myself right at the same time and even a little bit before I'm focusing on getting them right. Right. And again, that thing of like, okay, yes, time is short, but I also have tons of time left to get this right. And so don't be focused so much on trying to get my nine year old to be the perfect little warrior poet when I still have so much, so much to grow in and so much to do. Take some time, back off on how hard I'm pushing on him, take some time to really push hard on myself to get myself where I need to be, and then re increase the pressure. And even as I'm doing that, he's going to follow. He's going to follow along. He's going to follow along all the time. Right. So, Focus on yourself first in order to become the man that you want them to become. And then you set that example and then they will follow it. Um, overall, I think everything in this whole book is summed up by the wonderful quote by Thucydides, which is the society that separates its scholars from its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. And the last thing in life that I ever want to be is a thinking coward or a fighting fool. That just sounds terrible. So there you go. Um, I would highly, highly, highly recommend this book, you guys. It is so excellent. I love John's message in here. I love the way he wrote it. I love the honesty that he speaks with. And this is the kind of book that needs to be flying off the shelves and making all the bestseller lists because it is exactly what men in our time need. So go out there today, buy a copy of it. Please, I beg of you, go do it. Read it as soon as God puts it on your heart that it's the one to read, I would say today, but you know, I'll give you some grace. Um, but yeah, go out, buy a copy of this book. It's so, so, so excellent. And yeah, I think that's all I got. Make sure you like and subscribe. Uh, I have new videos coming out all the time. And yeah. I'll talk to you guys in the next one.